A reading from Psalm 34. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace and love and joy and gladness and jubilation in the risen Lord be with you all. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, as I preach to you today through this wonderful ministry of A Sermon for Every Sunday, I want you to know two things. First, I want you to know this good news. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. And second, I want you to know this promise. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. I'm preaching today on Psalm 34, which may seem strange. Some pastors don't preach on the Psalms or they find it awkward, but I don't. And it isn't just because I'm a professor of Old Testament who specializes in the Psalms. I find it easy to preach on the Psalms because they are the songs that God has given me to be the soundtrack for the imaginary drama of my life. You know how there are musical soundtracks for TV shows and movie dramas. If my life, and I hope yours, had such a soundtrack, the music and words would be provided by the Psalms. Here's an example of that from my son, Gunner. Eight years ago, Gunner was only about five or six years old, and uh, I live in Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes, and I bought a used boat. I, because I grew up in Minnesota, I always wanted a boat, and so about eight years, my wife, eight years ago, my wife said that uh, I could have a boat. So I bought a, a used uh, speed boat, and the first time I took my young son, Gunner, out on it, it was a beautiful day. It was 80 degrees, there was a few wisps of a cloud in the sky, there was a bald eagle flying that lives on the lake uh, where we go. And uh, Gunner, because he was a young boy, said, well, how fast will this boat go? And because I also am a young boy, I said, let's find out. And so I jammed the throttle forward and the nose of the boat kicked out and then it planed out perfectly. And there was just an exhilarating moment of being in God's good creation. And my son Gunner stood up and he searched back in his memory for some sort of sound that could, that could give expression to the emotions he felt like. And he said, hallelujah, hallelujah. He started singing the hallelujah chorus. And uh, I thought about that later and I thought he didn't learn that at home because we don't really play classical music at home. We play mostly, you know, country and folk and bluegrass on, on our devices at home. And I thought he learned that at church. He, he went to church, to church music school and to worship, and there he learned the Psalms, to sing the Psalms. And when he needed a bit of music that could express what he felt like to be in God's beautiful creation, he sang, Alleluia. The Psalms give us the words of praise to sing or say when life in God's creation is beautiful. Hallelujah, we say, praise the Lord, God is good. But the Psalms also give us the words of pain, to cry out to God when life is awful and frightening. Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forgotten me on this, uh, when he was on the cross? And here's one I give to a lot of people. The first line from Psalm 69, save me, O Lord, for the waters have come up to my neck. The Psalms also give us the words of trust for when we are scared and want to claim the promise of God's presence. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. I fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Or from Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? Think with me for a moment about that image of the water coming up to one's neck in Psalm 69. Save me, O Lord, for the waters have come up to my neck. Isn't that both a powerful and beautiful but terrifying image? I think everyone can relate to a moment in life when the figurative waters of life's troubles had, had come up to the neck and stretching out, you just thought, you know, the waters are up here. I can't take one more thing. I, I'm barely hanging on and keep on going. I've been there many times, many times in my life, brothers and sisters. Let me just tell you about one time. 
from when I was 16. I had a time when the waters had come up to my neck and I couldn't take one more thing. And then one more thing happened and then another thing happened and I was at my wit's end. And what I did, of course, in the words of Psalm 34 was, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. The time was this. I was 16, year old, 16 years old, and back when I had been 15 years old, I lost my right leg to bone cancer. It happened suddenly. On November 16, 1980, my right leg was diagnosed as having a tumor. I cried to the Lord. At first, no answer, so that Wednesday, November 19th, that leg was amputated in order to save my life. I cried to the Lord. No answer. The following spring, the cancer spread to my lungs, and I cried to the Lord. Again, no answer, so I had surgery and I had chemotherapy added to my life. And then the following fall, a second tumor started fresh in my left leg, and the doctors tried to save that leg, which was a mistake, but everyone makes mistakes, and treatment for the advanced form of my type of cancer was then in its infancy. I cried to the Lord and no answer, but then it was in those days, it was in November 1981, a year after first diagnosis, cancer in my lungs, chemotherapy, cancer in the second leg, that I discovered this second line of the psalm was powerful, and the line is this, taste and see that the Lord is good. So let me tell you about when I discovered that. I was staying in what was the, the, the home for families with children with cancer at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and my dad was staying with me on this particular day as I was getting radiation and chemotherapy. And my dad said, uh, he said uh, his friend Jerry was coming down and gonna take us out to dinner. And I, and I was really sick. And I said, dad, go and have a good time. And uh, I didn't wanna go. But Jerry, Jerry was a guy who had this uh, magnetic, uh, sort of charismatic radiance and he got there he made me go. And so we drove outside of Rochester to a little country club in the country, and I was mad. I didn't want to go. I felt terrible. I just, I didn't want to be there, but, you know, they wrestled me into the car and into this wheelchair, and we got to, we got to the restaurant, and we got to the table, and the waitress who had the old polyester union, uh, you know, country club, supper club, uh, wait, uh, uniform on, she comes over and she says, what do you have? And Jerry says... How are your ribs? She says, our ribs are good. Now he said, no, no, you don't understand. I really want to know if your ribs are really good. She goes, yeah, yeah, our ribs are really good. She, I'm not getting through to you. I want to know if your ribs are the best. If your favorite uncle were coming to town, when you were a girl, he did everything for you, and now you would do anything for him, and his favorite food were ribs, would you let him eat the ribs here? And she said, I would insist. He had our ribs, and Jerry said, we're all having ribs. Well, that moment at that little supper club turned out to be the best moment in the worst part of my life. It was a moment of feasting, of celebrating life in the midst of cancer, with death hungry for my second leg, and it was the best and brightest moment of life in the darkest and worst part of my life. And still, I cried to the Lord, and he answered me. He answered me in part with that feast, with that moment of celebration. Now, eventually they had to take that second leg too and the cancer remained active for another 20 months until it stopped coming. And then in fact, the truth is it came back 26 years later in 2007, but that's another sermon maybe for another year and a sermon for every Sunday. What I want you to know today is that I cried to the Lord and I cried and I cried and I cried and he answered me and he saved me from all my fears. Fears of what life would be like with the disability, fears about cancer, fears about death. My legs, of course, were never restored. God doesn't always work that way. When God answers prayer, there's not always restoration, but there always is abundant life. And I was restored, not physically, but restored to a full life, a joyful life, and I hope a servant life for others. And rescue from fears that I held in 1981 turned out for me so that I can tell you that it can be a great life to have a disability. It can be a fantastic life, a full life, to live in less than a full body. And I want you to know 
from Psalm 34 that this promise is trustworthy, that God is good. How good is God? Well, taste and see. God is as good as the best ribs ever on an autumn night in Minnesota. God is as good as the sweetest fruit ever on a summer day. God is as good as that sip, first sip of coffee in the morning or that first sip of wine in the evening. God has promised us his presence in our lives in the middle of our suffering so that in our despair, we can cry out to God and he will answer eventually. And God has given us this abundant creation as a sign of God's goodness. So from time to time, the people of God must feast. We must feast together as churches. We must feast individually. We must feast on our own birthdays. We must feast on Christ's birthday. As a church, we must feast on the birthday of the church when we celebrate the Spirit's outpouring. We feast together at Easter, the victory of life over death. And sometimes we even feast in the middle of our worst despair so that even as we cry to the Lord, we can also taste and see that the Lord is good.